Hello, and welcome to our online service for Kendrick's Creek United Methodist Church. Especially welcome our new members and guests today. We are the loves, obviously not Pastor Steve. He will be delivering our message in a moment. Until we're able to hold in-person events, there are many ways to contact us. One of the easiest ways to access sermons, messages, and to initiate contact is through our Facebook page. We also have a website, www.kendrickscreek.org. The website holds lots of information, including a contact form. The contact form allows you to receive information about events in our church and weekly guidance from Pastor Steve. We also encourage you to share any needs you might have in which we can offer support. A big thank you to everyone that has continued to support our financially, our church financially during this time. You can give safely and securely online through PushPay. Simply go to the website and you'll find an online giving tab at the top of the page towards the right. We are missing our church family and look forward to celebrating our faith with you today. Val will lead us in prayer, and then Pastor Steve's sermon will follow. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for this opportunity to share our faith with our family today. Even though we're missing everybody, it is nice to take time and pause and celebrate your love in any manner that we can. A special prayers go out to teachers and students as school is beginning to start and there is a lot of uncertainty surrounding what it's going to look like. It will definitely look different this year. Prayers for everyone that is suffering or needs extra support. We pray that they look towards you for guidance and faith during this time. Again, thank you for this opportunity to celebrate your love today. Enjoy our sermon. Amen. Amen. I think one of the worst feelings in the world is like when you are sound asleep and then you have to get like awakened and then have to do something. I, I've been like notorious for this for years. Like I, I do tend to wake up early, but I'm not really like a morning person. At least I don't like to talk to people in the morning. Like, so I used to, I was a rower in college and we had practice very early in the morning and I'd meet like one of my best friends in the world, we'd meet like every single morning at 530 at like the bottom of the stairs. And then we'd walk down to the boathouse together and we would make that walk like a half a mile in like complete silence every single day. I mean, I just, I'm just not a talker. Like I need, I need like some coffee coursing through my veins to get me ready to go in the morning. Uh, mostly the way that this like happens now is that um, someone in my house who's usually very small and also very loud um, whose bedroom happens to be adjacent to mine. Like we'll wake up in the middle of the night and like be very insistent that someone come to see her and she might be too. So it's okay. Um, and then like, I will have been sound asleep and then I will be instantly jolted awake, but like not all the way awake, just half awake. And then I'll like wander, stumble out of the bed and it's dark and you can't see. And so you're just like kind of stumbling, trying to find stuff, bumping into walls, like stubbing your toes on all the like laundry baskets that like left. Maybe you don't do that. I don't know. I do. And like, I'm stubbing my toes on everything and like walking into walls and doors and it's bad. <laughs> it's a, it's a rough place to be. Um, there's really nothing worse than that feeling of like not wanting to be awake, but having to be awake. And, and it's that like state of being half awake. That's a bad place to be in life, um, right? We can all agree. But the thing is like as true as that is physically, it's also true spiritually. That frankly, too many of us wander through life half awake to the kingdom of God. We're like still asleep to God and his kingdom. Like we're, it's like we're stumbling around like 
blind to his reality, blind to the things of God, blind to the spiritual worldview, and just kind of bumping our toes and running into walls and slamming into doors. And all the while, just he's inviting us into something different. And the reason we want to talk about that today is because that's where we find ourselves in the story of Jacob, the series that we call Founding Father, where we're looking at the life and the story of Jacob, who became Israel, the founding father of the nation of Israel, um, and looking at his story together. And, And what we'll see is that Part of his life is a lot like that, where Jacob, we realize, has been half asleep for about 40 years. But Jacob is going to start to wake up. He's not going to get all the way there, but he's going to start today. And so um, just to recap very briefly last week, we we remember that Jacob's name means grasper, the one who grasps. He's always this guy we hear in the first like 40 years of his life where he's always constantly reaching out and grasping for a blessing, always trying to achieve the next thing to through manipulation or deceit to try to take what he wants and to bring it into his life to achieve the right kind of outcome that he thinks he deserves. Um, And after spending years doing that, this is what we're told, is that Jacob's father, knowing the conflict this caused between Jacob and his older brother Esau, knowing that this caused a lot of issues and they want to kill each other, uh, Isaac, Jacob's father, sends him off to go find a wife. Esau has been married for a number of years. Jacob is 40 years old and is not married. And this is unusual for this day and age, right? Like most of the time you get married off pretty early and you need to start producing children pretty early because you did not live to be 90 <laughs> very often in the ancient world. Uh, Jacob is 40 and he's unmarried. And so um, Isaac, his father, sends him off to like his, uh, his technically his, his uncle's family in this place called Aram. Uh, He sends him off there to find a wife. And this is what we're told. Isaac sent Jacob on his way. He went to Paddan Aram to Laban, son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, who was the mother of Jacob and Esau. So Jacob's going to his uncle's house to find him a wife from among his first cousins. Okay. It's the ancient world. Listen, 5,000 years ago, it was a lot different. Um, and, And that's where he goes to find a wife, someone from his own household, someone from his own family, someone from his own lineage whose culture and practices would easily assimilate with his own. Um, And so this is what we're told, that on the way out of town, on the way away from his father's house for the first time ever, he's on his own now, on his own for the first time ever. We remember back to last week, it talks about how how Jacob did not have a relationship with God. He spoke of Isaac's God as the Lord, your God, not the Lord, our God, not the Lord, my God, but the Lord, your God. He had been just living in that space in his father's household, kind of sheltered and protected, but never took those things and made them his own. And sometimes you have to get out on your own to really start to live that life. I mean, it's, it's an important part of life. Um, and so this is what we're told is that Jacob on the way, he set down camp um, to go to bed one night. It says he had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven and the angels of God ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you that I will do. So I think we have to notice a couple things here. This moment, like Jacob, just he beds down for the night. He finds himself a nice rock to put his head on a pillow. Like, I think that's partly why he has his dream. He's using a, a rock as a pillow, but neither here nor there. Um, and then God shows up to him in a dream on this night. Um, now I want you to know something. God gives Jacob this incredible promise. This promise is like, I will carry this covenant that I made with your, your dad and your grandfather. I will carry it on through you and your family. Your family will be a blessing to the very ends of the earth. Jacob, your family will change the world. You will be the father of that nation. Now listen, at this point, Jacob had not a relationship with God. God's the one who takes the initiative. God's the one who shows up. But even more than that, keep in mind, Jacob didn't even have a wife. And God's promising that his descendants would be like the dust of the earth. This is a big promise. It is a bold promise. And it's a hard one for Jacob to receive. But here's what we need to remember is that You're not the one who's initiating a relationship with God. God is always the one who takes the initiative to bring that relationship out. He's the one who takes that step. He's the one who reaches out. 
So very often people think like, oh, if I can just do X, Y, or Z, then I'll, no. God is the one who's calling. God is the one who's reaching out. God is the one who's offering the invitation. And so if you feel that pull, even the slightest pull, the fact that you are watching this video right now tells me that you are not doing this just because you simply thought it was a good idea and you happen to stumble across it on Facebook or on YouTube. No, you have been invited here to this place by the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob into this place to hear what he has for you. And so we have to remember that anytime it comes to our interactions with God, he is the one who extends the invitation. It's his invitation to extend. And he does it. Uh, Very often in the places and the times when we least expect it, very often when we think we're just going about our normal life, um, God extends this promise to Jacob even um, even before he had a wife through whom to ensure this promise would be realized. Um, And so here's where where we're at, right? Is that Jacob, this grasper, this this man who feels like he needs to pull and stretch and reach and manipulate and deceive and go through all these different kinds of things to get the right outcomes in his life, he receives this promise of God's blessing, this promise of God's blessing that like he would have a large family and that his family would be obviously wealthy because they would be very large. And in the ancient world, if you had a large family, then you had a wealthy family. It typically was the way that it went. He would have everything that he could ever have wanted in life. And notice that Jacob did not have to do anything to get it. He just had to take a nap. (laughs) God will provide for you. And he wants to provide for people um, in the places like where they're not working to get it. Like he just wants to give it to you. And again, you can't achieve, you must just receive. Um, He receives this promise of God's blessing. He didn't do anything. And so it was when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place and I was not aware of it. Jacob was then afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the very gate of heaven. And here's what I think we need to remember. So he gives it this name. He calls it Bethel. We, we hear that. Maybe you've heard that word. It's a very nice biblical word, Bethel. It literally means in Hebrew, Bethel, the house of God, Bethel. Um, he realized something that he said, surely the Lord is in this place. But what he, he maybe did or did not get, but what we need to get is that surely the Lord is in every place. The Psalms say the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. There is no place that God is not. There is no place that he will not go to. And very often he will show up in those places that you do not expect him to be. And that frankly, you would rather that he wasn't, but he is there. Everything is his. It belongs to him. And there is nowhere that he cannot be. Jacob had that realization in this moment that God was in this place. He didn't know it. He wasn't looking for it. He wasn't expecting it, but God knew it. God knew he was there. And God knew what Jacob needed. And so he met him in this place and he gives him this promise, this promise at the very start of his journey um, to carry it through. And and here's something else that we need to keep in mind is that like, it's still going to require a lot of faith on Jacob's part. Like God didn't give him a step-by-step, did he? God didn't tell him like, Jacob, listen, this is exactly what you need to do to make this dream realize. Like this is what you got to do to make it happen. No, he just says, here's the promise. Do you trust me? We need that faith. We need to trust God. That's what faith is. It's trusting God. It's walking with him and trusting him and receiving his promises and saying, yeah, I do believe you. And yeah, I'm gonna walk with you. And his greatest promise is that I will be with you. Remember, that's what he told Jacob. I will be with you and I will will walk with you through it. You don't have to worry about it. I will walk with you through this. Um, But we hear that Jacob seemingly still doesn't really get it because after this very moment, we're told this in Genesis 28 verse 20, it says that Jacob says, okay, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I'm taking, which side note, he already said he would, whatever. He says, if God will be with me and watch over me on this journey I'm taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God and the stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that I give you, And of all that you give me, I will then give you a tenth. Jacob does something that most of us do at some point in our lives, that we start making deals with God. We start cutting a bargain with him. We say, okay, God, if you get me through this situation, if you get me out of it, if you provide A, B, or C, then I will do this for you. Is that, you know, we want to be careful here, right? Because it's in some sense, right, it's not the worst thing. Because at least you're engaging with God, you trust him, you trust that in some sense he will provide for you. 
Like we acknowledge and recognize that. But on the other hand, I think the reason this can be a problem is because we misunderstand God's very character and his nature. Listen, you don't have to cut deals with God. You don't have to cut deals with him to have a to 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 have the kind of things that he's promised. Like he already promised Jacob that he would be with him. He already promised Jacob that he would be successful. He already promised Jacob that the ends of the earth would belong to his family, that the world would be blessed through his family. He already promised him that. Jacob doesn't need to cut a deal with him. Look, whatever it is that you're struggling with, whatever it is that you feel like God has promised you, whatever it is that you desire in your life, listen, God will provide for you the good things in the world. And if your desires align with his will and his heart and the good that he has for you, then that's a done deal, okay? It will happen. It will come to pass in his time and in his way, but it will come to pass. You do not need to cut deals with him. You don't need to do the thing that says, okay, God, if you get me through this, then I promise that I'll go to church, right? That was something that I, honestly, we heard <laughs> a lot of us. Maybe you made that promise with God in March. So, okay, God, if you can uh, uh, get us through like March, or April, then I promise like when church opens back up, I'll be right back in the doors. How's that working for you? So here's the problem with when we make a deal with God is that God will always live up to his end of the bargain, but very often we do not live up to ours. Misunderstands who he is. Jacob didn't have to do that. And he didn't have to do, but see, that's the other thing is that even still, he's not willing to really receive God and all of he's, he says, if you get me through this, then you will be my God. <laughs> like he's, he's still um, not understanding what God is inviting him into and the kind of offer that's on the table here. Um, we hear this. Jacob eventually does get to where he's going. He gets to Paddan Aram and he gets to the house of Laban, his uncle. And I'm going to try to summarize this story. It covers a lot of ground, about three chapters here in Genesis. And I'm going to try to summarize it pretty briefly uh, for us. It says that when he shows up, his uncle Laban had two daughters. So Jacob had two first cousins. One of them is named Rachel and one of them is named Leah. Leah is the older cousin. Uh, Rachel is the younger cousin. Rachel is very attractive. Leah is not, right? Leah has, we're told, weak eyes, which is like a nice Hebrew idiom for saying she, she ugly. Like, it is not a nice way to, put, like, they're trying here. But uh, she is not very good looking. Um, but, but she's the oldest daughter. And so the custom would have been uh, for the uncle, Laban, to give away his oldest daughter, in marriage first, I mean, right? That's just the way, you know, you get older, you stop, you know, eventually stuff doesn't work right. You can't have kids anymore. Eh, Got to get rid of the oldest ones first. So very pragmatic. So that's what he's intending to do in this case. Jacob, however, sees Leah and says, eh, I like Rachel. She pretty, like I'm going to go with her. How's that sound, uncle? Um, to which his uncle says, okay, I'll cut you a deal. Everybody cutting deals in this, in this story. He says, I'll cut you a deal. Uh, if you work for me for seven years, then I'll give you my youngest daughter, Rachel, in marriage. And so, uh, so Jacob says, all right, whatever it takes, I'll do it. It's pretty romantic. You know, the guy's willing to work for it. Um, so for seven years, for seven years, he works for his uncle Laban. For seven years, he works and takes care of the flocks and does whatever his uncle tells him to do. And he suffers for seven years for Rachel. And then on the wedding night, um, so keep in mind, in the Old Testament in particular, particularly you see it in Genesis, when people get married, it's really not like the ceremony that, uh, that is actually what the marriage is. Like in the, in the very biblical sense, okay, uh, people are married when the two become one flesh. You with me? <laughs> like when they have that, intimacy, the sexual intimacy. That is what unites people when they become one flesh. That is what marriage is in Genesis. And so um, we hear that on the night of the wedding, right, there's a tent and, uh, and Laban uh, puts Leah, the oldest daughter, in the tent and, and waits until it's dark and says, okay, Jacob, you may now have your bride. And so Jacob goes in to consummate the wedding. Apparently, like it was real dark. I don't know. Maybe he had too much to drink. Like I, he just didn't notice um, that this was not the woman he thought he was going to marry. Uh, but he realized it in the morning, at which point, like it's too late. Like <laughs> they're married. So that's a problem. No take backsies, right? You can't, you can't undo what just done happened. Okay. So um, Jacob is a little upset 
understandably, feels like he'd been tricked, which, you know, ironically, from the guy who found a way to manipulate and deceive everyone else in his life, interesting that that's what eventually gets done back unto him. Sounds very biblical, doesn't it? Like, you know, be careful the measure that you measure out to other people. Judge not, lest you be judged. All that good stuff from Jesus really coming into play here. But so Jacob is pretty upset. He's been um, deceived. And so he says, well, okay, um, what can I do then to have Rachel? Laban says, okay, okay, I I get you're upset, um, nephew. But I tell you what, I'll give you Rachel as as your second wife now if you agree to work seven more years for me. And Jacob, again, doesn't seem to take a whole lot of convincing. He's sort of like, ah, oh, let me think about it. Yeah, no, I'll do that. This deal. We'll do it. Um, so Jacob has now two wives, two sisters, Leah and Rachel as his wives. And um, it's a rough life to live. <laughs> um, listen to this, is that over the course of the next several years, after 20 years of living in his uncle's household, this is what we hear, is that Jacob has four wives, basically. Uh, What happened in the middle is that there's this kind of sisterly feud going on on who can have the most children. Leah, we're told, was not loved by Jacob. He did not really like her very much, and he did not love her. He loved Rachel. She was his prize. She was his wonderful, beautiful bride. Leah was the one who had weak eyes and was often forgotten about. And so we're told that God saw Leah, and in his mercy, he had pity on her, and he made sure that she would be the one who had kids first. And then this then started like a child war where they're each trying to have more children than the other. And to ensure that they would have more kids, they enlisted um, their servants to then also become Jacob's wives. So they each brought a servant into the mix. And so at the end of this day, Jacob has four wives, 12 sons, one daughter, and a few thousand sheep. Life has worked out pretty well for Jacob. After 20 years, he has gotten everything that he wanted to get. And Time out for just a second. How did Jacob get this? Was it because he worked hard? Was it because of his ingenuity? Was it because he tried so hard? Because he was so smart, so clever, so crafty? How did Jacob have this incredible life that he wanted from the very beginning? How God gave it to him, didn't he? Like God told him, get up and go. I will be with you. Trust me. But Jacob falls into this trap that so many of us fall into which is that when we get to the end of this place and we finally achieve the things that we wanted to, even if it was something God called us to, even something that we thought that was really good and godly and that he was inviting us into, we get to the end of it and we say, man, look at how awesome I am. I crushed it. I'm just crushing this life thing. Go me. And we forget that it was never our work anyway. Like every good and perfect gift comes from above, James says um, in the New Testament. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. Side note, kind of interesting. You know what James actually means? If you translate it back into Hebrew, it means Jacob. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. Every good gift that you have in your life, it comes from God. Don't forget it. It wasn't because you worked so hard. It wasn't because you were so awesome. I mean, sometimes you do work hard and you do achieve things and that's wonderful and bless you for it. But God is the one who gives the gift. He is the giver of the gifts. He is the one who bestows the blessing. He is the one who brings those things to fulfillment in your life. Don't ever forget it. Jacob, we're told, uh, forgot it, (laughs) not surprisingly. Um, And he seemed to not really understand quite what was going on here. And he'd gotten very comfortable. He'd forgotten that he was on a mission. He had forgotten that God had called him to become a great nation. And he had gotten pretty comfortable with his idea of having four wives and a lot of land and a lot of sheep. And that seemed pretty nice to him. And so on one day, one particular occasion, it's, we're told this, the Lord said to Jacob, Jacob, go back to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. It's basically this kind of wake up call. Jacob, wake up. You've fallen back asleep. Do you remember the promise? Do you remember the dream? Do you remember the vision that I set out before you? This is not about you, Jacob. This is about the entire world that I want to bless through your family. So go back home. You were never meant to just camp here in this place. So don't miss that, right? That's the call that God is inviting Jacob into. And very often, honestly, that's the call that God is inviting us into. You have not been blessed so that you can sit on it and say, look at how awesome I am. You've not been blessed to be like Scrooge McDuck. You know who Scrooge McDuck is? Go back and watch the movie DuckTales. It's on Disney+. Plus. You can totally do it like right now if you just pause this and go, um, maybe don't do that. Wait like 10 minutes and we'll be done. Um, 
Scrooge McDuck uh, has like this vault of like golden coins, right? And he just like has this, he goes and like swims in his vault of golden coins. As a kid, like that's the image of what I thought like adults did. I don't know why. It's like you just eventually the goal was to just build a vault of gold coins and then go swim in it, which have you ever tried to like swim in gold coins? I feel like that would be really hard and really painful, but Scrooge McDuck did it. So I felt like it was totally cool. Um, the goal is not to just sit on your pile of blessings. The goal is not to just hoard all of your wealth. The goal is to then be that blessing to other people. That is why God gives you those blessings in the first place. That is why God does things in your life. So you can extend that to other people who do not know him, who do not have those blessings, who do not have that relationship with him, to extend that through you to the very ends of the earth itself. Jacob had forgotten that and receives his call from God to go back home. Uh, But rather than just simply doing what God said, Rather than having an honest conversation with his uncle and be like, uncle, I've been here for 20 years and I've fulfilled my bargain and you fulfilled yours and it's time for me to go back home, which was what I said I was going to do from the very beginning anyway. Rather than just doing that, Jacob, come on, man. It's like he, ah, it's so frustrating to read this sometimes, but look back at your life. You ever want to just like shake yourself and be like, what were you thinking? Listen, Jacob, rather than just doing what God said, He's got to go back to his old ways, right? He's got to manipulate. He's got to deceive. He's got to go move in the shadows to work this out what he thinks is a good way. And so we're told this, that one day when Laban had gone to shear his sheep, Rachel stole her father's household gods, his pagan idols. Moreover, Jacob deceived Laban the Aramean, by not telling him that he was running away. So he fled with all that he had, crossed the Euphrates River, and headed for the hill country of Gilead. If he had just had an honest conversation with his uncle, then all of the pain and heartbreak that was going to come in this just awkward conversation would have been avoided. But instead, he just took off in the middle of the night when his uncle didn't know what was going on. When he just like took what he felt was his rightful share, which, you know, was, but he just could have had a conversation with him and said, hey, you know, Uncle Laban, it's time for me to go. But he didn't do it. Instead, he chose to make his exit uh, rather inconspicuously. And frankly, I think this is the place that so many of us find ourselves. Um, not just like taking you know, our uncle's sheep and children in the middle of the night. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about we find ourselves in this place where we've been awakened to the presence of God. We've heard a call from God. We've even maybe followed that a little bit of the way. Um, but that we're still half asleep. It's like we're wandering around our house in the middle of the night trying to get like down the hallway, bumping into stuff on the way and stubbing our toes on laundry baskets. Um, We're asleep to the fullness of his kingdom. And, uh, And I think this is a really tough place to be because it's in this place that we do what Jacob did. I mean, right, we, we go back to our old nature. We start to deceive. We start to manipulate. We start to think that it's up to me to achieve the right outcomes. We, we start to cut deals with God and, and make promises to him that we can't possibly live up to. Um, and we check all of the religious boxes to stay in his favor and to stay in his good graces so that we think if I do that, then I will get what I want. But by and large, the daily conduct of my life is unaffected. And, and honestly, just for me to you, um, growing up in East Tennessee, this is most of my experience with church people. There were some really genuinely good people that I met, but there were a lot of people that I knew who made sure that they checked all the right boxes. They looked the part. They went to church when they had to go, and, uh, and they prayed when they needed something, and um, they made sure that people knew that they were Christians, but it didn't change the, just the gritty day-to-day conduct of their lives. It didn't change the way that they thought. It didn't really change the way that they spent their money. It didn't change the way that they spent their time or who they spent their time with, when in reality, what God is most interested in is not how things around you would turn out. He's interested in how you would turn out, about your character, about your heart, about your identity. That's what he's after. Um, Jacob, like so many of us, has a very difficult time with that. And part of why this is such a bad place to be, I mean, if you don't understand, you don't believe that that's just like a kind of objectively not great thing, then here's why that's particularly problematic for you. Because if the the consequence of every outcome is up to you to achieve it, if it's up to you to maintain that image and that identity, listen, the weight of that will crush you because you can never do that. You can never live up to that. 
Just like Jacob eventually, like the weight of that will crush you because it's all on you to make it work. Because Jacob thought that the blessing of God was all about people and relationships and stuff, you know? He, his dream was to have to have like that lakefront property and then that house in town too. And then to have the, the three or four cars and like at least one boat and a couple of beautiful wives and then a couple of mistresses too, because why not? And then to have a bunch of kids who were very obedient and excelled in sports and looked great. That was his dream. Um, but maybe that's not the blessing that God had in mind. Maybe that's not what God's blessing is about. We touched on that before. Um, I want you to go back and listen to God's promise. Listen to the actual promise that God gives to Jacob. It's really not about stuff. I mean, yes, he does promise him that like your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, but this is really the heart of his promise. He says, Jacob, I am with you and I will watch over you wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised for you. I will be with you always even to the very end of the age. I will, I will walk with you through this life. The blessing of God is the presence of God. It is not just stuff. And so here's why I think that's important for us today is because we find ourselves in a world where a lot of that stuff is maybe not there, right? Like a lot of the experiences that maybe some people live for, they're not happening. They didn't happen. They're not happening now, and frankly, they might not happen in the future. Um, or maybe it's actual stuff. Like you go to the grocery store, and there's not as much stuff on the shelves as there used to be. Or maybe because you found yourself in difficult job situations, you don't have the same amount of income, and then maybe that's like hard for you to figure out, okay, well, the lifestyle that I was living is maybe not sustainable. Maybe, question mark, is it the right kind of lifestyle to be living anyway? It just If nothing else in this current season of, of our culture and society, it should give us pause to reevaluate and reassess what's really important in life and what it really means to be blessed in this life. Um, the promise that God gave Jacob was that he would bless him with his presence always. I will always be with you. It was the promise that he received at Bethel it was the promise of the stairway to heaven. It was the promise that the gate of heaven itself would be open to him without his having to do anything to make it so. And a few thousand years later, in the Galilee, there was a rabbi named Jesus. And he told people that the kingdom of God was at hand in him. That you didn't have to do anything to earn it. You did not have to be the right kind of person, have the right number of zeros in your bank account to be able to access it. It wasn't about the clothes that you wore. It was not about the food that you ate. The kingdom of God was available here and now through him. And this Rabbi Jesus, to a people Israel who had forgotten the promises of their God, he told them this. He said, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. In Jesus, we see the fulfillment of every promise of God. In Jesus, we see the very presence of God willing to walk with us through any situation in life. In Jesus, we see that the blessing of God is the presence of God. And that is genuinely good news. That you do not have to face anything alone. You don't have to face the bad times alone. You don't have to face the good times alone. Very often those good times, when life is good and it is you are comfortable, those are the hardest times to live a moral and a good and an upright and a, a life rooted in the kingdom of God. Because you don't need him. At least you don't think you do. But it's in those places, Jesus, I will be with you. It is the blessing that God offered Abraham. It's a blessing that God offered Isaac and Jacob. It wasn't wealth. It wasn't possessions. It wasn't long life. It wasn't nations. It wasn't boats and bank accounts and jobs and, and wives or husbands. It wasn't cars. It was stuff. The blessing that God off offered was his presence. Now, keep in mind, a lot of that stuff came to these men. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they had possessions, they had lands, they had large families, they had all of these things that they could have possibly never dreamed of, that they always wanted. They did receive those as well. 
What the blessing was about his presence. So why Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and everything else will be taken care of. Do not worry about what you're to eat. Do not worry about what you will wear. Do not worry about where you will lay down your head. I will provide those things for you. Just simply seek first my kingdom and everything else will be taken care of. And here's what I want us to hear too. Maybe you need to just hear that. Uh, But the second part of it is that then God gives you that blessing to extend that through you to the world around you that needs to receive it. The greatest thing that you can give someone is the presence of God. The greatest gift that you have to offer the world is the presence of God in you. The greatest thing that anyone can receive is the love of God worked out through your life. And just very practically, I just want to share this really neat story with you. Um, I got this call, I guess, a few weeks ago. Um, it was just a lady called the church, and so there's no one who hangs out at the church and answers the phone, so she left a message, which is completely okay and perfectly normal, and called, called her back in an appropriate and reasonable time. Um, and, uh, and so she called and left a message, and uh, she was asking if there was any way that we could help her to donate some stuff. She had a bunch of furniture a um, bunch of clothes, a bunch of other things that she wanted to donate to people who needed it, um, who needed it in the community. Uh, and she said that she knew that we did charitable work and that um, she hoped that we could uh, help her out. And so I, I handed this, I punted this one over to Mike Hale and said, hey, Mike, can you, uh, can you run this one down for me? And Mike gave her a call back and, and talked with her about some things and figured out what it is that she needed. And, and he asked her like, well, how did you come across our church um, what is it that made you think to reach out to us? I mean, there are dozens, hundreds of churches that you could have reached out to. Why us? Um, and she said, well, she's actually from like another part of the Tri-Cities, but her mom lives in Colonial Heights. And uh, and so that's how, but like even then, right? Like Colonial Heights, there's a lot of churches in Colonial Heights. I don't know if you knew that or not. A lot of buildings, a lot of properties here. And, and uh He's like, so, so what was it? I mean, was it like your website? Was it like someone that you talked to? What was it? She says, no, it was your parking lot. Your, your parking lot? Like what in the world does our parking lot have to do with like donating stuff? She said, I saw that you had signs in the parking lot for emergency overnight parking. And I then thought that meant that you were good and loving people and that you would know what to do with this stuff. We want to be the kind of people with signs in our parking lot. We don't want to be the kind of people who are always wondering like whether or not we should tow the car in the parking lot. We don't want to be the kinds of people who are wondering if we should put gates on the edge of our parking lot to keep people out so that we stay pure and undefiled. We want to be the kind of people in our lives as followers of Jesus who will invite people in and say, yes, if you need a place to stay, you can stay here. You can park your car here. It really doesn't matter to us. Who cares? It's just a parking lot. I'm not using it. It's a posture. It's a posture of extending the blessing that God has given to you to people all around you in the world who may look very different from you, who may talk differently from you, who may not even believe what you believe, but to recognize that through what you offer to them, you are extending the very presence and love of God to them. It is the greatest gift that you can offer. And so often it is in the smallest of ways that you think are utterly inconsequential. When as a church, like we agreed to put signs in the parking lot for emergency overnight parking, we thought it was more pragmatic than anything. What we did not know is that it would convey a very clear message to people around us that this is a place where you will receive love, where we will ensure that what you need to be taken care of will be taken care of. That is the kind of message that we need to send as people in our lives. Because remember, the church is not a building and the church is not a parking lot. The church is a people of God. And our lives are the testimony to his kingdom. And through the way that you live your life, people will see and come to know and believe the truth of the gospel. It's on you. Now, I know that's hard. I know that can be scary, but it's on you. That's why God placed you in the world. You are his strategy for reaching a lost world. You are strategically placed to share his love with people in the world around you. And so I invite you to think about that as you go about your life this week. Uh, for teachers, I think this will this will be the first week before school starts. Maybe like we're recording this a little in advance because I'm going on vacation, but y'all know that. Um, and so when this comes out, like this, maybe if school is a thing, this will be the first week before teachers go back to school. Um, and this is a great example of it. They're like 
what you have to offer your students, the greatest thing is just your presence, the presence of God in that classroom. God has strategically placed you there to make a difference in their lives for the rest of this year. And for the rest of us who maybe aren't teachers, maybe we find ourselves in in workplaces or in homes or um, in our families or wherever that may be, in our neighborhoods, God has strategically placed you there to make a difference in that place, to share his love and extend his kingdom in that place, to live out his rule and his reign in that very place place. So I'd like to pray for you. Just pray a blessing over you. Invite you in to receive that gift and invite you out to then share it with the world. So if you would just open your hands um, and your hearts as we close out this time in prayer today. Father, we thank you for your blessing. We thank you that the blessing is not uh, in goods and in stuff that will perish and that will go away. We thank you that the blessing is your presence. Eternal, imperishable, and always good. We thank you that you will walk with us through any and every situation in life and that you have given us this very blessing not to just hold on to it and to pat ourselves on the back, but to then take it out into the world to those dark and sad and lonely and broken places in the world to extend your love and your grace and your forgiveness and your mercy and your care and your concern and your truth and your justice in those places in the world. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will be upon us today and to fill each and every person who receives this message, that they would be empowered to carry your truth in your life, in your word, into their workplaces, into their homes, into their neighborhoods, into the grocery store, into their schools. Um, throughout the next months, that we can confidently say that you are good and your love endures forever and that you have given that love to us to steward and to extend and to safeguard in this world. And I pray that you would bless them and keep them. Make your face shine upon them and be gracious to them. Lift up your countenance upon them and give them your very peace. For it is in the name of Jesus, our Lord and King, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, folks, if there's anything we can do for you this week, please do reach out and let us know. Just remember, you are carrying the presence of God with you this week. Um, You don't need to be afraid. There is nothing that you will face that is too big for him. Love you, praying for you. God bless you. Take care. Have a great week and make a great rest of your day. We'll see you here next week, the same time, the same place. 